someone who is there to help you, to guide you, to bring you through the process. That's what they're doing. Right? So that's what you're looking for. Just like Avram Avinu went to Eliezer, so we see a case study in the Torah of what a Shadchan is meant to be. And just if they mess up once or twice, you still should try and try again. And if they're really not hitting, then you try someone else. You don't know where your mazal is going to be coming from and paying for it. Listen, I'm like you. I don't like to part with my hard-earned money, but it's a motivator. And if that's what a shadchan needs in order to just put them ahead and they need to make a living, and I'll be honest with you, I do not. There are professional shadchanim out there who make this their main panasa. I don't envy them in any way, shape, or form. I would not like to be... Can you imagine doing this as a job? Not just like a one-off favor for a friend or a family member, you know? But be in it, and you've got to be there, and you've got to take phone calls, and what's the person like, and the family, and you've got to... Oh, I just... I know the questions I ask Shadchanim. I don't want someone asking me those questions, you know? Most of the time, I just kind of bluff my way through when they ask me these questions. I think it's okay to pay. I think it's okay. If that's what they need to motivate them, they're entitled to make a parnasa, they're giving you their time. If they were a doctor, if they were a lawyer or something, we wouldn't think twice about them giving you a service. They're giving you a service, not a problem. And even if they're not a professional shadchan, I heard this actually from a great rabbi. Paying a shadchan, who actually, you actually end up getting married. Okay? That's for sure. If the shadchan actually marries you off and it ends up, it goes to the, you go to the chuppah, after the chuppah, even before the chuppah, you should give a gift to the shadchan. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. It could be just a token, right? It could be, I don't know, like a, whatever it is, money or a gift or something. Why is that important? Because paying the shadchan to bring you together is the first act of chesed that you're doing as a couple. And that's a great thing. So I'm talking about once you're married. At that point, I'm, up to now I'm saying as you go through the process, even just a little bit of motivation, which I hear is a little controversial. But afterwards, if it's success, you got to that point, and there are rabbis out there who have said this. So I'm just quoting who say that sometimes you hear people who go through problems in their marriage, and one of the first things they should look into is, did they show their appreciation to the shadchan or shadchanit? Because if they didn't, they haven't paid it back. And they're not paying it forward. And so you've got to bear that in mind. So God willing, all of Yisrael Hashem will be giving a nice gift to your Shadchanim as soon as you get engaged or get to the Chuppah or after the Chuppah. Nowadays, maybe wait till after the Chuppah, you know, because, you know, you know, I remember when we got married, we had a photographer at the, at the wedding. Um, so the photographer said, you know, before the wedding, you need to pay the full amount. I'm like, well, can we pay afterwards? Like when we see the finished product? And the photographer said, are you aware of this? I said, no, I need all the money up front before I even get my camera out of the case. I was like, but what, who does that? Right, everyone pay, I pay a little before and a little bit after. When I see the negatives, He's like, no. He's like, unfortunately today, the divorce rates are so high and so fast that many times they get divorced and they don't pay us. Because it takes me a couple of months to get the photos together and by then, it could be done. I don't get paid. Because you're not paying the photographer. Lolaine, it should not happen to anyone over here. But this is the situation we're dealing with today. And I'll be honest with you, I am involved in many different worlds. I wear many hats, you know. A black hat, a black yarmulke, you know, a baseball cap. So I see many worlds. And in the religious world, I'm talking about the very religious world, it's become a phenomenon which did not exist when I grew up. I'm telling you know right now that these guys and girls get married. The girl, the girl comes back from seminary in Eris Yisrael, and she's on a high, and she loves Hashem, and she loves everyone, and they get straight to Shidduch. Ah, I found my Zivug. He reminds me so much of my rabbi, right? And he gets married. And then within a very short amount of time, it's become, unfortunately, a disease. 
a disease. I know many people now, Rabbanim, and I agree with this, who you don't start dating. And this is true for Bali Tshuva, by the way, as well. Until you've been in it for at least six months. Six months just to land, kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Chill out. And then you can start dating. You got to like swing the pendulum another way, Abyssal, you know what I'm saying? And then you, um, and then you can keep going. Okay. So, Hashem is the ultimate Shadchan. The longest tefillah we see in the Torah, so prayer and Shiduchim are intrinsically connected one to another for everyone, praying for yourself. And of course, and I, I know I've mentioned this before, but the best way is to pray for somebody else. Praying for someone else is the best thing you can do. This is advice from Rashi. The best way you can find a Shiduch, say the rabbis, by the way, it's not just a Shiduch, it's for anything, right? It's to find someone who is in a very similar situation to where you are. Geographically, financially, culturally, I'm not even sure. But as close as you can be, you pray for them, says Rashi, based on the Gemara, based on the story in the Torah, you get answered first, Nanet Tehillah. It's based upon the story of Avram Avinu, whose Sarah got kidnapped, and then the person who kidnapped Avi Melech got very, very sick, and he prayed for Avi Melech first. And he was answered first, Avram was answered first, by having his wife get pregnant. And then Avi Melech got cured from his disease. And they say the two episodes are connected. When you pray for someone else, you get answered first. So praying for someone else, by the way, it's a great thing to do. It shows your selflessness when it comes to your desire to uh, care for someone else. Because praying for yourself is okay, by the way, and it's a good thing to do, and very commendable. But praying for someone else is even more commendable. I'm going to add another layer to this, and this may sound a bit weird, but I give this advice out regularly, maybe too regularly, as you'll see in a moment. Many people approach me about an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend they're upset with, and they haven't got over it, which is very common. I mean, it's understandable for a month or six weeks, but some people go on for months and months, and they start dating other people, but I keep thinking about this guy or this girl, just this Shabbat. I was approached, I promise you, this Shabbat, a girl, I spoke inside, I came out to the Kiddush, a girl approached me, I said, what's going on, this shidduch situation, and she said, I have a guy, he's very interested in me, but I can't stop comparing him to the guy I was dating two guys ago. That can't be good, can it? That can't be good. Like two guys, I hear you broke up last week. I hear it. But two guys ago? That's not healthy. There's something going on over there. So we discussed a few different things that she should be doing. But one thing I told her to do, and I give this advice to everyone, and I've used it myself in other situations. When you know a situation is done, when you know you have to move on, but you're having trouble moving on because this person is still living in your head rent-free, I mean, as people here I've actually told this advice to, you should pray for them. Why would I pray for them? Right? They broke up with me. They're terrible. Why do they do that? I'm still in love with them, blah, blah, blah. I hear. But if you pray for them, for their success, for them, Hashem should get and mention their name. They should find a shidduch and they should find their zivug, their marriage partner soon. When you do that, you kind of like move them away from this fantasy in your head and you concretize them. And you're giving them a bracha. And it takes them out of this kind of ethereal, like non-real person. And it kind of grounds you and grounds them. It makes them a, less, a, a lot less kind of like unapparent. I don't know how, how else to describe it. It gives you confidence, and I know this technique actually works. So if right now, any of you are suffering from an ex, whatever, that's still living here, you should daven for them. You should pray for their success. I mean, pray that you get over them as well. That's also worth doing. And if not, you should definitely seek a third party to help you to do that, right? Because after a certain amount of time. I want to talk about signs. I want to talk about signs. People come up to me, and they say, Rabbi, I had a sign that this is the guy, this is the girl I'm meant to marry. We met once or twice, but I know this is a sign. I just broke up with him or her, but I had a sign this is the person I am meant to be with. And they'll tell me a story, maybe a crazy coincidence, 
that kind of like fits in. And in their head, this coincidence is a clear sign that they are meant to be with this person. I'll give you an example, a true story. A girl had dated this guy for a long time, and trust me, she wasn't meant to marry him, but she dated him for a long, long time, and she'd managed to break up with him, and she broke up, and I said, you know, we need to take a little break. It's okay, a little break afterwards, four to six weeks to get over it, and go to Israel to study, get away. So I found a place for her to study in Israel, take some time off, chill out, go study, and come back refreshed. She calls me, it was like middle of the night, and she calls me and says, Rabbi, you've got to hear this amazing coincidence. I have a sign that me and Mike are meant to be together. I was like, interesting. Did an angel come down from heaven and tell her? Did she hear the rocks of the Kotel speaking to her? No. She's walking past Mike's place. You know what I'm saying? Mike, you remember Mike's place? I don't know if it's still around. But I just got a Mike. And she's walking past Mike's place, and she looks at it, and she thinks about Mike, her ex-boyfriend. At that, this is a true story. At that precise moment, she gets a phone call, or maybe it was a text back then, I can't remember, from Mike, saying maybe we should rethink us being together. And she's like, come on. Isn't that a great sign, Rabbi, that me and Mike... And me, just I'm walking past Mike's face, I look up, I'm like, oh, Mike. And Mike calls me. Isn't that a siman? And by the way, I've heard many variations of this in every way, shape, or form. I'm going to say something very unromantic. That could be a sign that you're not meant to be together. And Hashem is saying you're still attached to Him, and this is the proof you're still attached to Him, and you should detach, which this case happened to be. So what are signs for? Can you believe it? My great-grandfather met his great-grandfather after the war, right? Or we went on vacation at the same time, and, and all this kind of stuff. I had a friend of mine. Friend of, a friend, a very close friend of mine. I grew up with him. My yeshiva growing up has been in. And he married a girl. When they were married, they were going through their album, and they saw that they went to Meron to pray for a shidduch. Or maybe it was the Kotel. I can't remember. But there's a photo in the album that they are both at the same time in the same place. They didn't know each other yet. Why they were both single. It's a good sign, right? It's only a good sign after you're married. In other words, signs work in retrospect, retroactively. You don't go forward with a sign. You look at the sign afterwards and like, ah, oh, that's amazing. Look, we're both in the same photo. You don't look at a photo and say, look, we're both in the same photo, let's get married. That's ridiculous. Things don't work that way. So seeing signs could be a good thing. Now, when I say sign, I mean some kind of like, if you see that you are meant to be together in terms of your personalities, obviously, seeing that, that's not a sign, that's just basic math, right? That's basic personality, and that's what we're meant to be. And that's going to be our future together. So look out for signs. They could be there to help you, but that doesn't mean to be. This is your zivug. It could be this person is meant to marry you, but maybe they're not ready because they did not ready themselves. And so maybe now you're not meant to marry this guy. If you're still single, it's years time. We can talk about it and all the signs will come back up again. But maybe now is not the right time. Maybe this person did not prepare themselves correctly to marry you at this exact point. But about all the signs? I hear. Maybe yeah, maybe no. It is what it is. And that's why you need a mentor. Whether that mentor is a Shadchan or not, and every mentor should be a Shadchan, and every Shadchan should be a mentor. You need someone who's going to guide you through the process to give you clarity. I'll be honest with you. I have my own children in Shadduchim right now, and I give them advice, and they say to me, you don't know what you're talking about, because my, and I'm like, you're right. You can't do surgery in your own family. And my mother always shouts at me, you give so many people advice, you can't give advice to your own daughter. I'm like, she don't listen. What are we going to do? And that's okay. She has her own connections, her own shadchanim, her own rabbanim, her own friends, and she finds guns. Once in a while, I get involved, and she's like, what do you know? And then I get out. And that's okay. It's painful, and it's a, a reality check, but that's okay. Hashem runs the world. Everyone's got to find their own place. I have a few minutes left. Has anyone got... That's the information I wanted to share with you. I'm pleased I carried my notes. I didn't even look at them. 
But has anyone got any questions or thoughts on anything we said? Because I want this to be more of a conversation. Awkward, right? Hi. Do I believe in what? Um, okay, so that's a very, very good question. Question is, do you believe in a shtar mechila? Basically, there's this idea that you should try to proactively create something in order to forgive a person. Look, there are many stories that I've read about and heard about secondhand of people. I mean, I just read the story recently, weirdly enough, about a girl who actually wasn't a girl. Huh. I just read this, I promise you. An entire class at a Beit Yaakov school that could not get married. They literally, none of the girls, and usually you have one or two or five, you know, but the entire class. And they went to a big rabbi, and the rabbi said, this is a little bit freaky. You usually get one or two shidduchim happening, but they literally, the entire class was like a year later, two years later, it was a little bit, you know, for religious girls, it was very strange. And the rabbi said, you should look back. Maybe as a class you did something. So what do you look back to? Your, your teachers. And they went back and they realized there was a teacher who they had been very nasty to. She was actually a young single girl, happens to be. At this point, she was married. And he said, go find her and get Michila. I don't think it has to be written out. Go to her and get Michila and ask for, and ask for forgiveness. And they actually did do that. And she said, you know, I was still angry about that year. Stopped me teaching. <laughs> I was a teacher. And after that, I'm like, I'm not gonna, these people are crazy. And I wasn't a teacher, right? Think about what I did to my rabbi now. And uh, she actually, um, they apologized and she accepted it. And afterwards, by the way, there are stories of people who have died and then you have to go back to the grave to ask Mechila. That's a true thing as well. You go with a minyan and you ask for forgiveness from the, uh, at the grave itself. That is a, uh, that is a minhag Israel. That happens and that's real. The idea that the, the tombstone is called a nefesh because a little bit of the person's neshama is there. So asking forgiveness from someone from the past, if you think it's blocking you, because maybe this person has held on to this, maybe they were mochal you, you know, then you probably don't need it. But uh, probably a good idea. I wouldn't go hunting for people you've offended, you know what I'm saying, unless it's like, you know, yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, 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 you're confusing me now. Even I'm getting confused by this. Yeah. Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. The question is basically, I didn't hear it, like how much faith you need to have, how much bitachon. If you don't have bitachon, it's not going to work for you, but if you have a bitachon, and then where does it start and where does it end? Kind of, I mean, that's, yeah, I hear it. Yeah. Okay, okay. It doesn't need to... No one says it's logical, by the way. It is what it is. We're meant to have faith in Hashem in general when it comes to Parnassah, making a living, when it comes to Shidduchim, right? When it comes to everything in life, we're meant to have a, a faith in Kaddish Baruch. That's always a good thing. Um, by the way, if that's true, then why get a Shadchan at all? There needs to be some Ishtadlut. Just because you are getting a job in order to make a living, although you can still believe Hashem gives you your Parnassah, just because you're finding a, a, a Shadchan to help you find a... Everyone has their own level. Everyone has their own level when it comes to Mekir Panasa or for finding a, a, um, a Shidduch. I don't have a clear answer for you, I'll be honest with you, right? Because I struggle with this, right? I pray to Hashem and then I feel it's like it's all on my shoulders. Well, which one is it? The answer is going to have to be it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both, you know? And there is a bit of a loop and sometimes your faith is high and sometimes your faith is low. Faith, everyone thinks that everyone, especially rabbis, their faith is straight. We have ups and downs. That's natural, that's normal. 
right? Many times I thought when I was single, I'm never getting married, right? And since then, I'm thinking she's never going to stay with me, right? There's times you have these ups and downs. That's okay. That's normal and that's natural. Short answer is, in essence, you still have to have faith in Rosh Baruch that you're going to find your zivug. And that is not, um, and if you do a lot and you try, that is not a lack of faith. It's never a lack of faith to try your best in order to find someone. So if you, I mean, could a person miss out on their zivug? We've spoken about that before as well. You've got to work very hard to do that. It's possible, but unlikely. But unlikely. You may defer it, but it's, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely okay to have that in mind, Akiva. No problem. The question was, if I'm praying for someone else, right, all I'm thinking about is I want to get married myself. So what? You go to business, right? I'm going to make, I'm going to, okay, Akiva, let's do it like this. You go to someone else, they're like, you know what? I've got a business deal. You're going to make so much money from this. What am I thinking? I'm going to make money too. Right? No problem. Why is that a contradiction? He's happy. You're happy. It's a win-win. It's the same thing. I got a business deal. You're going to make 50 million. I'm going to make 10 million. Right? You're like, oh, but it's not for you. You're making 10 million. Yeah, but you're making 50. Or even the reverse. Make it no, no problem. It's a win-win. You're not saying you shouldn't get, so I do get. No problem. That you're going to get. But your motivation is for you to get money. Ah, uh, here. And for their good as well. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not tied to the The two don't come. Don't think that I'm, I'm praying for you just so I get answered first. So what? Do you care? You as the recipient of that to fill up, you're like, I hear, you want to get married? Throw it my way as well. Nothing wrong with it. It works in Parnassah. It works in Shidduchim as well. <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Sugulot, right? <laughs> okay. So I, I have a lot to say on this. It's, I, I don't have that much longer. I will say that some segulot are, have a tradition, they go back, and they are written down in the holy books, and they have room for, though we may not fully understand them, people do them. There is, a, what is a segula? Is a fortuitous act. It's not a mitzvah. It's not even a minhag. It's not even an inyan. It's, like, it's, like a, it's a segula, right? It's a kind of like an optional area that may, you know, there's a famous joke. Right? I have a sugula to make a great living, get a job. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a sugula. So are there real sugula? There are. I can't stand here. Many people will say, there are rabbis who are like, ah, they're all nonsense. Can't say that. Some sugula have a tradition. You don't have to do them, but you can't poo-poo those that actually do. Right? Sugula to bite the pitum off the, off the etrog, right? To... Um, that's a sugula. There's a sugula against Ein Hara. There is one real sugula that is written down. The red bracelet, no. But rubies are, are a red stone that you put next to the baby's crib or you wear while you're pregnant. Different opinions. I've seen that in some very legitimate books. Neged Ein Hara. Do I understand them? They're above my pay grade. But that's a real sugula. And there's many. You've got to check into them. A sugula could move into something called Derech Amorim, the, the, the way that the Amorites and the other nations used to act upon it. So you've got to be careful. But if you check with a rabbi who knows his stuff and is learned in it, it could be. And in that situation, it doesn't hurt. It may not help, but it doesn't hurt. But some sukkulot have it, praying for 40 days, going to the Kotel. There are misorah, there is a tradition to do these things, and therefore that should not be an alternative to following halakha, right, doing your hishtadlut. I'm going to sit back and, you know, bite an etrog. That ain't going to work. You know what I'm saying? Well, they'll probably have a very great business, right? Selling etrog at etrog prices after Sukkot, take a bite out of it, you know? Okay, last one. Yeah. He says that it is going to affect the acceptance of your tefillot. That is correct. Oh, your mitzvah, yeah. Where are my prayers? Or where do they go? Yeah, like, are they, like, or, like, when, like, if I'm fasting, I'm not all of a sudden, they just go off. Like, I don't understand, so, like, what does it 
I don't know the answer to that question, right? Are they in limbo? I'm not sure. But he does say that. He does say the quality of your mitzvah. He actually says that angels can come and actually testify against you. That I know he says specifically. But once you do teshuvah, maybe the door's open, right? Maybe it's you're plugging up your mazal and you pull out the plug and your mazal fl flows through. I've seen that happen many times. I've seen people who... I was once I knew a guy, I tell you something, the biggest low yutzlach I've ever met in my entire life. The guy was the biggest loser. It's not like you don't know who he is. Really? I mean, I, I met this guy and for years and years, just nothing. And then he just started making some changes in his life and suddenly just worked for him. He found an amazing girl. I have no idea where she married him. He's a complete loser. But she married him and she's in love with him and they have kids and he has paranasa and the guy's still a loser and yet his mazal opened. Do I understand how this happens? If, if anyone would say to me, should I marry this guy? I would have said, absolutely not. The guy is a, a complete doofus, right? Unless the person was also a doofus, then I set them up together, right? Because, you know, doofus marry doofus. Okay, I'm exaggerating and being funny as well. But I hear it. And yet you never know where your mazal is coming from. So is it possible that one act could open up a person's mazal and the backlog of all the tefillot suddenly pour through? Okay. Good stuff. Thank you all very, very much for being part of this. Thank you for your questions.